Good morning, Psychology 201. Happy late Thanksgiving to you. I hope your holiday was a blessing that you were able to visit family and friends and kind of catch up on some things. So we are beginning our class. Once again, in-class session begins today and we will be in class at our regular time, 10 a.m. We are looking at chapter 13 in social psychology. So I'll begin my lecture video on a part of the social psychology today. There'll be a second video that I will do to finish up the chapter 13. Chapter 13 is not a long chapter. So possibly by Wednesday, we may already be in chapter 16 and Friday finishing up those chapters. So that next week will be a review of chapter 13 and 16 for our final. And from per my understanding, I believe you wanted your final to be in a multiple choice format and so that will be made available um, by early next week so that you can finish some things a little earlier and get onto some of your other assignments so just looking at our syllabus for this week we're in unit of 14 assignments and this is the week of the 26th we are just one week behind in things and so 13 6 13 and 16 will be what we'll be looking at this week if I'm on the right track here, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So you should already have your personality theory, the therapy paper should have already been in, I believe the 21st of November. And so all of your papers should be done by now. If you have not turned them in, turn them in immediately. So let's go ahead and let's, let's get into chapter 13, social psychology. All right, just a preview of social psychology. Social psychology is a scientific study of how we think as a people, how we influence others through our own behaviors and how we relate to one another. Social psychology is all about that social piece of interactions. And thinking about others' behaviors is, and its possible causes, we tend to underestimate the influence of the situation. The external elements influence our situation thus committing the fundamental attribution error. Attitudes affect behavior. Hmm. Attitudes affect behavior when external influences are minimal, especially when the attitude is stable, specific to the behavior and easily recalled. Does any of you have a recalled attitude? <laughs> our actions can also modify our attitude especially when we feel responsible for those actions. Your actions can modify your attitude. Research on social influence indicates that behavior is contagious. Wow, so certain behaviors and certain attitudes can um, flourish, they can catch on. Um, attitudes, Joy, for example, just off the top of my head, can be contagious. Have you ever walked into a room and smiled at someone and they smiled back? And that happiness kind of engaged in the conversation? Yeah, some attitudes are contagious. Sometimes group experiences arouse people to make them become anonymous. They just want to get in the group and hide and thus less self-aware and self-restrained. Uh, within groups, discussions can enhance members' prevailing attitudes and produce a group think. Some people feel in, encouraged and their mind turns on when they're in a group and they can collaborate and come up with ideas and cross-pollinate information more readily. Some people are not. A minority committed to a position can, however, influence a majority. So prejudice can be both overt and subtle. And overt prejudice wanes. Subtle prejudice lingers. Social barriers and biases are often unconscious. We all have some biases and so this may be a good uh, opportunity to maybe examine your own biases and the things that you um, are prejudiced toward. Prejudice arises from social inequalities, social divisions, and emotional scapegoating. Prejudice also has cognitive roots. Aggression is a product of nature and nurture. 
In addition to genetic, neural, and biochemical influences, aversion events heighten people's hostilities. Aggressive behavior is also learned through rewards and by observing role models and media violence. Geographical proximity physical attractiveness and similarities in attitudes and interests influence our liking for one another. Passionate love is an aroused state we cognitively label as love. Compassionate love often emerges as relationships mature and is enhanced by equity and self-disclosure. Altruism is the unselfish regard for the welfare of others. The presence of others at an emergency can exhibit, inhibit helping. The bystander effect, many of you guys have heard of the bystander effect, is most apparent in situations where the presence of others inhibits one noticing e an event. Many people can witness an event and not too many call the cops or call authorities or help. They just assume someone else is going to do that responsibility or do that job. Many factors influence our, influence our willingness to help someone in distress, including cost-benefit analysis and social norms or expectations. Conflicts are fueled by social traps and by enemies forming mirror image perceptions of one another. Enemies become friends and when they work towards superordinate, subordinate goals, communicate clearly and reciprocate gestures. All right, so here's a few food for thought questions. Fact or falsehood? Compared with people in Western countries, those in Eastern Asian cultures are more sensitive to situational influences on behavior. True or false? Let's see, that is true. And I'll read the question again. Compare it with people in Western countries. Those in East Asian cultures are more sensitive to situational influences on behavior. It's true. To change people's racist behaviors, we first need to change their racist attitudes. What do you think? In order to change behavior, we have to shift a person's attitude. That's false. All right, one more fact or falsehood and we'll come back to some of these. Chimps are more likely to yawn after observing another chimp yawn. Many of you may be able to answer this question because it happens in humans as well. When you yawn or someone yawns next to you in the class, it may automatically cause you to yawn yourself. That's true. All right, so let's move forward with some of our discussion here. Social psychology. All right, so let's deal a little, deal a little bit with the fundamental attribution era. Identify what social psychologists study and discuss how we tend to explain others' behavior and our own. So a social psychologist Social psychologists studies what we think about, how we're influenced by other people, and how we relate to other people. The attribution theory states that we tend to give a casual explanation for someone's behavior. We can just kind of explain behavior away. We may explain people's behavior in terms of internal dispositions, a dispositional attribution, or in terms of the external situation, a situational attribution. For example, a teacher may explain a child's hostility in terms of an aggressive personality or as a reaction to a stress or related experience, or maybe some abuse. The fundamental attribution era, our tendency to overestimate personality influence and underestimate situational influences. They lead us to unwarranted conclusions about others' personality traits. For example, we may blame the poor and the unemployed for their own misfortunes. And some people do. 
attitudes and actions. Discuss how attitudes and actions interact. So this would be an interesting discussion. Attitudes are feelings. Often, these feelings often influence our beliefs that predispose us to respond in a particular way to objects, people, and events. For example, we may feel dislike for a person because we believe he or she is mean and as a result act unfriendly toward that person. Attitudes. Do you have an attitude? Food for thought. Make you think. Attitudes often predict behavior. Activists on both sides of the, the debate about the reality and dangers of climate change know that public attitudes affect public policies. And so are aiming to persuade the peripheral route persuasion, peripheral route persuasion. So you'll hear a lot of terms that we'll talk about here. Peripheral route persuasion, attitudes, let's see, fundamental attribution era and attribution theory. Some vocabulary. Peripheral route persuasion occurs when people are influenced by incidental cues, such as a speaker's attractiveness. The central route persuasion occurs when interested people focus on arguments and respond with favorable thoughts. Attitudes affect actions. When external influences on what we say and do are minimal, and when the attitude is stable, specific to the behavior and easily recalled attitudes affect our actions. Attitudes also follow our behavior. For example, the foot in the door phenomenon. It is the tendency for people who first agree to a small request to comply later with the larger request. Because doing becomes believing. A trivial act makes the next act easier. Similarly, the behaviors associated with a new role may initially feel phony. However, they soon seem to reflect our true self as we adopt attitudes in keeping our own roles. Cognitive Dissonance Theory proposed by Leon Festinger, Festinger argues that people feel discomfort when their actions conflict with their attitudes. They reduce the discomfort by bringing their attitudes more in line with their actions. All right, let's take a look at your slides here. So your first slide deals with just the vocabulary, social thinking, social influence, antisocial relations, pro-social relations, social psychology, the social thinking, social psychologists and what they cover, what they, what they study. We talked a little bit about social psychology is the scientific study of how we think about and are influenced by the relations with other people and things. Social psychology studies study those phenomena of our interactions with other people. The study of social influences explain why the same person will act differently in different situations. Social thinking when explaining our behaviors, especially from an individualist Western culture perspective. So fundamental attribution error committed by underestimating the influence of the situation and overestimating the effects of stable, enduring traits. Behavior more readily attributes to the influence of the situation. Explaining and attributing actions can have an important real life social and economic effect. So social thinking, we just talked about the fundamental attribution era. Napoleon and colleagues, Neopo Neapolitan and colleagues. Students, the, the print is getting smaller and smaller. So let me see if my glasses are gonna work here. All right, barely. Students attribute behavior of others of personal traits even when they were told that behavior was part of an experimental situation. And so with the Neapolitan and colleagues theory 1979, 
is a part of that fundamental attribution era where students were attributed a certain behavior of their personality traits. That's just the way that I am. That's just the way that I behave. Even when they were told that that behavior was a part of an experimental situation, they still behave the same way. An attribution question, when we attribute poverty and homelessness to social circumstances or to personal dispositions, it affects and relates to our own political view. It shapes how we think and it shapes how we behave. All right, attitudes affect our actions. Attitudes and, and feelings influenced by beliefs that predispose reactions to objects, people, and events. The peripheral route persuasion, we just talked about that. The central route persuasion, actions affect our attitudes. A foot in the door phenomenon involves compliance with a large request and with a smaller request and later enduring a larger request. Role playing in, includes acting a social part by following guidelines and expected behaviors. So, so social thinking, the foot in the door phenomenon, people agree to that smaller request and find it easier to fulfill the larger request. Social thinking, when attitudes do not fit with our actions, tensions are often reduced by changing attitudes to match actions. Cognitive dissonance theory. All right, so we're going to move on here. So social influence and conformity and obedience is in your slides on page two. Social influence, complying with social pressures. Describe automatic mimicry and explain why conformity experiments reveal the power of social influence. The chameleon effect refers to our natural tendency to mimic others. Unconsciously mimicking others, expressions, postures, voice tones helps us to feel what they are feeling to empathize. This helps explain why we feel happier around happy people and why research has revealed the mood linkage, a sharing of ups and downs. Research experiments, research participants in experiments tend to rub their own face when confederates rub their face. Similarly, the participants shake their own foot when they are with a foot-shaking person. The most empathetic people mimic are and are like the most. And so we tend to mimic, unconscious mimicking, what other people are doing. Conformity is adjusting our behavior or thinking towards some group standards. Solomon Ash found that under certain conditions, people will conform, conform to a group's judgment, even when it is clearly inaccurate. Experiments indicate that conformity increases when we feel incompetent or insecure. Admire the group status of attractiveness, have made no prior commitment to a response, or being observed by other group members. Where we come from a culture that encourages respect for social standards, and in a group with at least three people who are unanimous in their judgment, we tend to conform. We are sensitive to social norms, and we sometimes conform to gain social improvement or social approval. Normative social influences. All other times, we accept information about reality provided by the group. Informational social influence. So obedience, following others. Describe what Milgram's obedience experiments taught us about the power of social, ex social influence. All right. So before we go, go, oh, go on, conformity and obedience. And I'm looking at the end of slide two. And so conformity and obedience looks like they feel incompetent and insecure. Their group has at least three people. Everyone else also agrees. They admire the group status and attractiveness. They have not already committed to another response. They know that they're being observed. Their culture encourages respect from social standards. Conformity and obedience. All right. 
So 13-4, describe what Mill Graham's obedience experience taught us about power of social influences. In the Milgram studies, the experimenter ordered teachers to deliver shocks to a learner for wrong answers. Man, wouldn't that be interesting? Torn between obeying the experimenter and responding to the learner's pleas, the people usually chose to obey orders, even though it supposedly meant harming the learner. Obedience was highest when the person giving the orders was closed at hand and was perceived to be a legitimate authority. When the authority figure was supported by a prestigious institution, when the victim was depersonalized or at a distance, and when there was no role models for defiance, right? When no one else staged a coup or when no one else uh, rebelled, then everyone else seemed to conform or be obedient to what the request was. The experiments demonstrate that social influence can be a strong um, enough influence that will cause the majority to obey or to create a unified conformity. Torn between obeying the experimenter and responding to the learner's pleas, the people chose to obey. The experiments demonstrate that social influences is a strong, strong, is a strong, is strong enough to make people conform to falsehoods and capitulate to cruelty. The studies, be, the studies because of their design, also illustrate how great evil sometimes grows out of people compliance with lesser evils. Evil does not require must, must, monstrous characters, but ordinary people corrupt by an evil situation. By understanding the processes that shape our behavior, we may be less susceptible to external social pressures in real life situations and lead us to violate our own internal standards. Everybody has an internal standards. And so when we know that this is the case, that we are more prone to um, obedience through conformity that if everybody is doing it then we're going to do it uh, kind of thing then we, we know that that is such a thing and that it does not whatever the thing that they're requiring us or asking us to do does not register or resonate with our internal um, integrity or our internal biases then we have the right to say no and we have the right to stand up for what we believe is to be right, regardless of what the punishment seems like. All right, describe how our behavior is affected by the presence of others. And this is the group behavior model. So let's just take a look at that sl our slides as we move forward. All right, suggestibility and mimicry sometimes lead to tragedy. The copycat violence, threats, after Colorado's Columbine High School shootings, there's a lot of copycats. Milligrams obedience experience experiments. People obeyed orders even when they thought they were harming another person. A strong social influence can make ordinary people conform to falsehoods and exhibit cruel behavior. In any society, great evil acts often grow out of people's compliance with lesser evils. People don't want to suffer. I don't want to feel pain. And so I will be obedient even if it goes against my moral behavior. All right. So looking at page four in your slides, Milgram's obedient experience findings. Obedience in the Milgram experiments was highest when people was given orders nearby was perceived as the legitimate authority. People were received to be in control and have the authority to dish out punishments. People were compliant. Research was supported by a prestigious institution. They had some money back in it pretty much. Victims were depersonalized or at a distance. 
And so they made people seem less than human so that they can follow out the orders that was given. There was no real model, role model to follow in regards to what defiance would look like. All right, in social facilitation, the triplet, presence of other accusers, presence of others arouses people, improving performance on easy or well-learned tasks, but decreasing it on difficult ones. All right, so so many of the things the, that I'm discussing, if you're done your reading, this, this would make sense to you. All right, so we're going to move on to group behavior. All right. Describe our behavior, describe how our behavior is affected by the presence of other people. Experiments on social facilitation. So it says that when people are observing us, when people are watching us, when people are um, critiquing us, then if we're familiar with it, we may perform well or perform at a better level of performance if it's a familiar task. If it's something that is new to us and we are learning it ourselves, we are on a learning curve, then we may perform horribly or do worse on it. When people pour, when people pull their efforts together in a group goal, social loafing may occur as individuals exert less effort. Some of you experience this in your team learning assignments that as you pull together as a group, not everyone pulled their own weight. And so some of you had to step up and do more than the others in order to get the grade that you desired. The social loafing is what they're called. When a group experience arouses people and makes them anonymous, they become less self-aware and less self-restrained, a psychological state known as de-individuation. And so this happens in our group think projects in polarization. Explain group polarization and group think and describe how much power we have given it as individuals. How much power we have as individuals. Within groups, discussion among like-minded members often produce group polarization and enhancement of the group's prevailing tendencies. Group polarization can have beneficial results as when it reinforces the resolve of those in a self-help group, but it can also have dire consequences as it can strengthen a terrorist mentality. Sometimes group interactions distort important decisions. In group think, the desire for harmony overrides a realistic appraisal of alternatives. It is important to remember that social control and personality control interacts. It impacts that groupthink model. A minority that consistently holds to its position can sway the majority, the minority influence. This is especially true if the minority's self-confidence stipulates others to consider why the minority reacts as it does even when a minority influence is not yet visible. It may be convincing members of the majority to rethink their views. Right? This is interesting that a m minority's perspective, a minority stance, a minority, a minority's political views may affect the majority's um, thinking processes and may cause the majority to adhere to a decision that they don't support morally. Define prejustice and identify as social and emotional roots. All right. Prejustice is a mixture of beliefs, often overgeneralized and called stereotypes. Emotions, hostility, envy, or fear, types of emotions and predispositions to actions, which is a discriminant or discrimination or a prejudice to certain actions. Prejudice is a negative attitude. Discrimination is a negative behavior. So let me say that again. Prejudice is a negative attitude. Prejudice may be a bias against anything. I have a bias for 
chocolate ice cream or a bias for butter pecan ice cream. A discrimination is a negative behavior toward a certain bias. Judging by what people say, overt prejudice has decreased dramatically in the last half century. However, subtle, implicit, automatic prejudices such as that reflect in people's facial muscles, responses, and in the activation of the amygdala, remember that's that caveman brain, to viewing black and white faces lingers. It's still there. It has not minimized. Researchers found that 9 in 10 white respondents took longer to identify pleasant words such as peace and paradise as good when presented with black sounding names rather than white sounding names. This is just the research. Priming people with a flash black face rather than a white face also makes them more likely to misperceive a flash tool as a gun. Nevertheless, overt prejudice persists in many places. It's not covert, it's, it's just out there and in your face. Overt gender prejudice has also declined sharply. But gender prejudice and discrimination still persist. It's not gone away. For example, despite equality between the sexes in intelligence scores, people have tended to perceive their fathers as more intelligent than their mothers. In most of the world, gay and lesbian people cannot openly and comfort comfortably disclose who they are and who they love. Dozens of countries have laws criminalizing same-sex relationships. But cultural variations is enormous, ranging from the 6% in Spain who say that homosexuality is mor morally unacceptable to the 98% who say the same in Ghana. When people have money, power, and prestige and do not, and do not the haves usually develop attitudes that justify things as they are. The just world phenomenon reflects the idea that good is rewarded and evil is punished. Victims of discrimination may react with either self-blame or anger. Either reaction can feed prejudice through the classic blame the victim dynamic. Through our social identities, we also associate ourselves with some groups and contrast with others, mentally drawing a circle that defines us, the in-group also excludes them, the out-group. Such identifications promote an in-group bias that is a favoring and one's own group, even creating an us versus them mentality. Facing the fear of death tends to heighten patriotism and produce loathing and aggression toward those who threaten one's world. The scapegoat theory suggests that prejudice off offers an outlet for anger by providing someone to blame. To boost our own self sense of status, it also helps to have others to denigrate. All right, so let's do this last piece and we're going to end this video with Identify the cognitive roots of prejudice. One way we simplify the world is to form categories. In categories, in categorizing others, we often stereotype them. Everybody's labeled. Overestimating the similarity of those within another group, outgroup homogeneity, geneity, the other race effect, or the cross effect, or own race bias is a tendency to recall faces of one's own race more accurately than faces of others. It emerges during infancy between ages three and nine months of age. We also estimate the frequency of events by vivid cases, violence, for example, that come to mind more readily, readily than the less vivid events involving the same group. 
Third, impartial observers may blame victims by assuming the world is just and that people therefore get what they deserve and deserve what they get. Finally, hindsight bias may contribute to the tendency to blame the victim. All right, so we're just going to catch you up on your slides. We talked about individuation. Involves loss of one's self-awareness and self-restraint. Overcoming in group situations. The foster arousal and anonymity. 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 Oh, why come I can't say that word? You know what I'm saying. Thrives in many different settings. During English to... England's 2001 riots and looting, rioters were disinhibited by social arousal and by the anonymity provided by darkness and their hoods and masks. Later, some of those arrested expressed bewilderment over their own behavior. This is page four. All right, we're moving on to page four of your slides. Group polarization and group think. You got the group polarization, you got the group think, and you got the individual power. Three different models there. Group polarization, if a group is like-minded, discussion strengthen is prevailing opinions. If there's some outsider in that group that thinks differently, there may be a division. Or if the group's thought process, if the group's voice is stronger than the outsider, they may influence the outsider's decision. Like minds network in the blogosphere. Antisocial relations. Prejudice and prejudice means prejudgment. The components, beliefs, emotions, predispositions. Prejudice is a negative emotion. Has important distinctions. Discrimination is a negative behavior. How prejudiced are people? Explicit prejudice in North America has decreased over time. Support for all forms of racial contact, including interracial dating. Social roots of prejudice. Social inequities. How often have often developed attitudes that justly justifies the status quo. Just because some of the overt stuff has decreased, and I, I, I kind of I war in my mind with that thought that the overtness of it has decreased. And if we look down history's model, then, then yes, some of the overt stuff has decreased to some degree, and yet it's still present. But some of the subtle prejudices, prejudices and passive aggressive behaviors of people have not. All right, antisocial relationships and groups. Through social identities, people associate themselves with others. Emotional roots of prejudice. We talked about the scapegoat. Uh, we talked about research evidence by Zimbardo. Prejudice levels tend to be high among economically frustrated people. Antisocial relationships, the implicit prejudice, the unconscious patronizing, the race influence perception, the reflective bodily responses, the categorizing of mixed race people, cognitive roots of prejudice, forming categories. We, we talked about that. The biological biology of aggression is where we'll pick up in our next video. And so this is um, chapter 13, social psychology. We'll end this video with maybe a fact and a falsehood. All right, so let's see. Most people would refuse to obey an authority figure who told them to hurt innocent people. Now we went over this uh, in, our, in our lecture today. Most people would refuse to obey an authority figure who told them to hurt an innocent person. True or false, fact or falsehood? This is question number four. It would be false. Our research tells us that if a person that, that they deemed was an authority and that they deemed were, were competent or in control of the situation and that the majority ruled and that they would experience some type of pain if they did not obey whatever that authority says. Most people would obey the authority despite how demeaning the act was. All right, back to some of this learning effect. 
Studies of college and professional athletic events indicate that home teams win about six in 10 games. And so this is question number five, studies of college and professional athletic events indicate that home teams win about six in 10 games. And so let's see if that's true or false. Question number five, that's true. So home teams win about six to 10 games. Studies of college and professional athletic events indicate that um, people are familiar with their surroundings. They know what is expected of them in their home environment. And they should be able to operate in familiarity, muscle memory, environment supports their ability to succeed and to perform certain skills. All right, individuals pull harder in a team tug of war than when they pull in a one-on-one tug of war, war. Question six. Individuals pull harder in a team tug of war than when they pull in a one-on-one tug of war. Let's see what the answer is. Question six, what do you think? Do individuals work harder when it's in a group or do they work less when they're in a group? Question six would be false. You're going to have those loafers. Remember we talked about those social loafers that since they're in a group, then they're going to allow other people to outwork them and they're not going to pull their own weight. All right. So this is the first part of our chapter 13 discussion. We will talk more about this in class and I will show some videos in regards to the social psychology piece of chapter 13. And then the next video will give our second half of this and we will move forward. So God bless you. I will see you today in class.